we've talked about biblical theology having two parts to it, and one is the actual events which bring the seed from the Garden of Eden, where God pronounced the curse on the land and told them that um, their seed would crush Satan's head. And we, we start from there, and then we watch the, gener the generations, the genealogies talk about the passing on of the seed from one generation to the next generation. And we see, you know, how strange things, the, the fact that it's a second born son, or even later than that, or um, in the case of Isaac, the second born son. And, and yet the, the promise doesn't pass on necessarily to the son you expect it to. In, in the case of Jacob, um, Esau should receive it. Um, Isaac fully intends to give the blessing to Jacob, but somehow, I mean, to, to Esau, but somehow Jacob in his sin actually turns that around. And so the blessing goes to Jacob. It had to go to Jacob because the promise was coming through Jacob. And that's the way this works. The seed passes from generation to generation to generation. It's all God superintending. Parents can't make the decision. It's God's plan on who's going to receive the seed next. And so we follow this through. And so one part of um, salvation history of God's great salvation story is watching the passing of the seed from generation to generation. But another part that's built into that is that there are great events that happen. And those events are incredibly important to God's salvation story. And we touched briefly on the idea of typology. We're going to do an article about typology, which is a really good article. Really good article. You may need, you may need to read it twice or three times because you really need to get it down. But this great article in typology, um, you can learn a lot. Typology, which we already talked about, is when an event like the Passover, which we're going to talk about today, or a person or an institution like the priesthood is a picture of Jesus Christ, or the sacrifice is a picture of Jesus Christ. The Passover is a picture of Jesus Christ. Crossing of the Red Sea is a picture of dying with Jesus Christ and coming out um, as a new creation on the other side. So we're going to look at this today. And what's important to recognize is the fact that there are certain events which become the key events in God's great salvation story. And you really can't understand God's salvation story without seeing these key events. And so we're going to look at the, of all the key events, the by far the most important key event, which is the Passover. So let's um, share our screen and jump right in and talk about the Passover. Okay, I, I title this The Presence of God Returns to Earth because um, really in a lot of ways, God's great salvation story is about human beings who are out, who are cast away from the presence of God. And then there's this movement of God to bring his presence back. When you follow the scriptures, you'll see that the prophets talk about this, um, this coming of the presence of God. The day of the Lord is not just judgment in the Old Testament prophets. The day of the Lord is also a time when God will come back to earth. And Jesus Christ is that fulfillment of that. Unexpectedly, he's the fulfillment of that um, presence of God returning. Um, but even in the Old Testament, we see a very clear pathway for the presence of God to return to earth. And so that's what we're going to look at partially today when we look at the Passover story. And so this Bible is the story of the humans living in God's presence. But then, of course, because of sin, they were exiled um, from God's presence in the great tragedy. And the Bible is a story of God's plan to bring humans back into his presence. I mean, the idea is not simply that God's going to forgive humans, but that God's going to be reconciled with humans and that humans are going to be reconciled to God and that humans are actually going to be able to be in God's presence again. And so the book of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, where they are in the presence of God, and the book of Revelation um, chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, that, that's like, the book of Revelation is the mirror that reflects what 
should have happened in Genesis does happen in Revelation that we are permanently forever and ever and ever in God's presence. It's like, that's the whole subject there. I'm not saying it's a central theme, but it is a very important theme. Each story in the Bible is a step toward returning to God's presence. The center of the story is God's promise. As we said already, one day EFC will crush Satan's head. The story of Moses, a really unexpected event happens, and you would never expect this based upon what we've read in Genesis 3, and that is that God appears in a burning bush. And you could say, well, it's not a real appearance of God. It must be Moses would have died. Yes, that's true. However, it is in some sense the presence of God because God tells Moses to take his sandals off because the place is holy ground. Now, that's not expected. That hasn't happened before. So there's something new going on here. The presence of God is returning. Now, God makes an amazing promise to Moses. He says, I will be with you. I certainly will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. I just want to point out, this is new. Uh, now, it's true that Enoch walked with God and then was not. So Enoch had some kind of a walk with God, but this is different. God is going to be with them, and he's going to be with them in a very real way, um, which we're going to see shortly. So this is something new. This is a big, important development in God's salvation story. But it's a, I can't tell you how important this is. God's presence cannot dwell on earth. It can't happen. I mean, it can't because humans are sinful. The Hebrews are sinful. Every human is a son or daughter of Adam. And, and we're not worthy for God to dwell um, on earth. Uh, we're, we're just utterly rebellious all the time, every day, all throughout the day. And every human is a slave to sin. And so to talk about God's presence coming to earth is like, can't happen. He'll destroy us all. Um, and, and the humans are sinful as everybody else. I mean, they're slaves in Egypt because they become idol worshipers. Listen to this verse. I'm sure you didn't read this verse before. Israel behaved are acted like prostitutes in Egypt, behaving sinfully in their youth. Acted like prostitutes in Egypt. So they're, they're in Egypt. Before they became slaves in Egypt, before they became slaves in Egypt, they began worshiping Egyptian idols. Now, we don't know this story. Ezekiel knows it, but we don't know this story because this is not written about in the book of Exodus. We just know that there's a generation that didn't know Joseph and Pharaoh. Put, put them into slavery, but this is why Pharaoh put them into slavery, because they were worshiping idols and God's punishing them. Listen to this, Ezekiel 23, again. Yet she multiplied her acts of acting like a prostitute, remembering the days of her youth when she acted like a prostitute in the land of Egypt. So new information, we didn't know, remember? We have the events of salvation history. We have the great salvation story, the events. But the word of God is the commentary on those events. We don't say, well, I think that this is what happened. No, we don't care about what we think. We care about what happened. And the word of God gives us the commentary. And Ezekiel 23, 19 is commentary on what happened. Listen to Joshua 24, 14. Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your fathers worshipped in Egypt and worship Yahweh. Whoa. That's a surprise, isn't it? So now we know something we didn't know before. We know that when they were in Egypt, they prostituted themselves. They were idol worshippers. Okay? They're just as sinful as everybody else. And it seems, it really seems pretty clear to me that the people almost completely forgot about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me show you this. I'm sure some of you have thought about this. After a long time, the king of Egypt died and the Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. And they cried out. And the cry for help ascended to God because of the difficult labor. Now, first you just say, oh, they're praying. That's not what it says. It says, they cried out. 
and their cry for help is centered to God. Notice it doesn't say they, um, notice they did not call God. They just cried and God heard their voice. Um, then Moses, this, I think this is very telling. Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? They should have known what his name was. They didn't know what God's name was. Okay, that's that's new information. Well, wait, wait a minute. That means that what God had taught Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about his grace, his mercy, his goodness, what Joseph had learned all those years of suffering were gone. Because in Genesis, they call God Yahweh all the time. But it's gone. It's all gone. Because Moses says, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, God of your fathers has sent me to you, they ask me, what is his name? They don't even know. They don't even know the story of Yahweh. They don't know that story. So you see what's going on here. It sounds like they've pretty much completely forgotten about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's pretty interesting. Why didn't Moses know? It's because they'd forgotten about Yahweh. I, I think that's the only possibility. So how can the holy God dwell with the people who are so sinful? The Hebrews were like all of Adam's descendants, full of rebellion and sin. God's plan. I got to move this out of the way. Make Israel holy. So what we've got here is the presence of God is going to dwell with them. But the presence of God can't dwell with them because the people themselves are so sinful. So what God's plan is, is to make them holy. Now it's not, can't really make them holy. Can't do it. Because they have to die in order truly to be made holy. So they're going to be symbolically holy. Not really holy, but symbolically holy. Now, ironically, we are truly holy even though our behavior is not fully yet. But God is making our behavior every day as believers in Jesus Christ to be more and more like Christ. And God's intention is to, to take the holiness which we have in Christ and to make that a part of our experience in our lives now, which is also good biblical theology in the New Testament another time. But here, God's going to make them symbolically holy. Listen to what he says. Now, if you will listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine. That's a very significant statement. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. Now, all the earth belongs to God, but Israel is going to be his belonging in a special way. Holiness is belonging to God in a special way. Everything belongs to God, us. But some things belong to God more than other things. When I remember he said, all the earth is mine. All of the earth is God's. So it's not like, you know, oh, I don't own that. No, no, he owns everything. But there's some things that belong to him in a special way. And when they belong to God in a special way, that's called holy. When something belongs to God in a special way, it's called holy. You will be my own possession out of all the peoples of the earth, although all the earth is mine. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. Um, so for God, this out of the way, to bring his presence to the seed of Abraham, God had to make them holy, his own possession. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. Now, I want you to catch that. You are a holy people belonging to to the Lord your God. That's what defines them as holy because they are God's possession. Hear me again. Holiness in the Old Testament is primarily possession. The holiness is relational. In other words, I have a special relationship with God. God has made me his possession and therefore I am holy. If something belongs to God, it's holy. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his possession out of all of the peoples on the face of the earth. Say you walk into a room and you see, um, you see there's a cake in the middle of the table. It's a lovely looking cake. And you're hungry. You would love to eat it. And someone says, 
that cake belongs to John. So, oh, John? You mean the John that's like two and a half meters tall? You mean the John that like picks people up and moves them out of the way? Yeah, that John. I wouldn't recommend eating it. Now, the cake is just cake. There's nothing special about the cake. What makes it special is the fact that it belongs to John. Now, if you eat that cake, then you're going to have to speak to John, and John's going to do something to you because the cake was his. And that is what holy means. It means that Israel was God's possession. And if you're going to fool around with Israel, you're going to hurt Israel, you're going to touch Israel, you're going to steal from Israel, you're going to cheat Israel, you're going to invade Israel. You have to understand you are dealing with God's special possession. They are holy. See, see what holiness is? It's belonging to the Lord your God in a special way. Oh, it's frozen. That's interesting. And the question is, how could God make the Hebrews who were so sinful to be holy? Well, it's, in, it's, it's symbolic in the Old Testament. It's symbolic because they're sinful, they have to die. So we're going to symbolically make them holy. So he, he had to buy them to make them his own possession. He had to buy them. The Egyptians will be as still as stone as a stone because of your powerful arm until your people pass by, Lord, until the people whom you purchased passed by. We're talking about the Exodus when they leave us in Egypt. And he says, you purchase these people, the people whom you purchase. God has to buy the people. In other words, for them to be his holy possession, he has to buy them. Uh, God could not simply buy the Hebrews with money or power because they were Pharaoh's slave. And Pharaoh would not let them go. That's the whole story. So what's going on here? Remember we said uh, the last lecture that it's a, it's a battle not between Moses and Pharaoh, but between God and Pharaoh, Yahweh and Pharaoh. And it's really a battle about who owns them. And that's really what the whole story is about. Who owns the Hebrews? Does Pharaoh own the Hebrews or does Yahweh own the Hebrews? Well, Pharaoh says, I own them. They're my slaves. I gave them the land. I made them slaves. And you, Yahweh, cannot take them away from me because they belong to me. That is a type, an Old Testament reality that is in history, but a, it gives us a picture of, our, of our Jesus Christ in some way. And here it gives a picture of people who are slaves in sin and cannot escape it. So God brought nine terrible punishments to Egypt to convince Pharaoh to let them go. But Pharaoh, of course, refused. He's not going to let them go. Why? Because he owns them. He owns them. And because he owns them, God, Yahweh, has to buy them. So God's solution is he would judge the slave masters by putting to death their firstborn sons. This is how God's going to purchase them. It's symbolic. It's symbolic. The fact that he only kills the firstborn sons shows that it's a symbolic purchase. Listen to what he says. So Moses said, this is what Yahweh says, about midnight I will go through Egypt and every firstborn male in the land of Egypt will die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the servant girl who is behind the millstone as well as every firstborn of the livestock. This is a symbolic. The reason it's firstborn is because the firstborn represents, symbolizes the future of the family. Pharaoh take the firstborn from every household in Egypt. And by the way, that's also the household of the Hebrews. He's going to take a firstborn from every household. The firstborn represented the entire family. God did not want to kill all the Egyptians. And here's a verse that I bet you didn't know existed. He wanted to display his glory. By now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague and you all would have been obliterated, in other words, wiped away from the earth. However, I let you live for this purpose, 
to show you my power and to make my name known in all the earth. I could have destroyed everybody in Egypt, which would have been super nice for the Hebrews. But that's not what God wanted to do. He wanted to let them live for this purpose so that they could see his power and make his name known in all the earth. And so what does he do? He takes the firstborn, the firstborn to represent the entire family. It's symbolic. It's real, but it's symbolic. Of course, it's right for God to take the firstborn sons. Why? Because the Egyptians had treated the Hebrews horribly. They had killed their sons. They made them slaves. They killed their baby boys. The Hebrews were just as sinful as the Egyptians. They also deserve to die. And this is really where the story becomes very, very, very important. The Hebrews should die. The Hebrews are sinful. The Hebrews are just as bad as the Egyptians. They're just like, you can't really make a difference between them. And so, yes, yes, I, I know the firstborn of the Egyptians should die. All the Egyptians should die. They're so sinful. But the Hebrews are no better. They worship idols. We read those verses, three different passages that tell us that they worshipped idols in Egypt. And they mistreated each other. Because the Hebrews were as sinful as the Egyptians, God is, was sending death to every household. And that's what sometimes Christians miss. They, they miss the fact that the people in the Hebrew households should also have died. There should have been firstborn dead in every household because everybody's sinful. So Moses said, this is what Yahweh says. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt and every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, Hebrew, Egyptian, will die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the servant girl who is behind the millstones as well as every firstborn of the livestock. Then there will be a great cry of anguish through all the land of Egypt such as was never before or will ever be again. Her household would experience death. No one would be spared. Death was coming that night. There was no escape from it because every firstborn Egyptian or Hebrew was sinful. So what could these Hebrew firstborns do to protect themselves? Their sins condemned them as worthy of the death, which was coming to Egypt that evening. God announced the Hebrews must make their firstborn sons holy through the blood of the sacrificed lamb. He's going to purchase them, making them his possession. And because the firstborn son represents the whole family, by purchasing the firstborn son, he's purchasing the whole family command is make your i know what it says it's got to get firstborns holy sanctify the word sanctify is actually built out of the word holy sanctify to me every firstborn the firstborn of every womb among the sons of israel both of man and of beast it belongs to me well this is in the exodus story this is in the passover story so the story is god is saying Make them holy. And what does it say? It belongs to me. What belongs to me? The first offspring, the firstborn from the womb belongs to me. And so what do you have to do? You have to make that holy to make it my possession. He's purchasing the firstborn sons of the Hebrews. And the word sanctify means to make holy. But how can he make them holy? The answer, the blood of a pure lamb. So this is interesting. He's going to make them holy. He's going to purchase them. He's going to purchase the Hebrew firstborn with the blood of a lamb. Now, that's interesting. I bet you haven't thought of that perspective before when you looked at the Passover story. God is purchasing the firstborn sons. And since the firstborn son represents the whole family, he's purchasing the whole family. He's purchasing them with the blood of a pure lamb. That's what's going on. So the blood that's painted around the door is really a purchase receipt to take the pure blood from a take the love a pure a pure lamb and sacrifice and collect its blood and then they were to roast the lamb and and to paint the sides and the top of the doors to their homes to, to stop death it's a it's a receipt you know you've got your receipt that says this has been purchased and that receipt blows your mind doesn't it that receipt is the blood 
of a pure lamb. And that blood of the pure lamb is the receipt price that says, I have purchased this firstborn who represents this whole family. God told him to stay inside the house, uh, eating the lamb's meat along with roti made for that yeast. This is the first Passover meal. And the Lord's Supper is based on this meal. You know, I hear all these things about what the Lord's Supper is. The Lord's Supper is a Passover meal. And therefore, whatever Jesus says, he is not saying, oh, this, this bread magically turns into the body, into my body. And this wine magically turns into my body. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. What Jesus is saying is that what you've been celebrating in your Passover meal for the forever, that is me. I am the one who gives the blood that becomes the purchase receipt for every sinner. My blood purchases sinners so that I can make them holy. That's what he's saying. So, God sent, whoops, 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 whoops. God sent, yeah, I messed that up. Um, a destroying angel to take any firstborn sons who are not protected by the blood of the lamb. Those who were saved were saved, not because of their righteousness or goodness, but because of the lamb's blood, us. Because everybody should have died. The whole point is he's purchasing them from what? From slavery. Slavery to what? Well, slavery to sin. Because they were slaves in Egypt because of their sin. God was judging them. He was disciplining them for their many, many sins of idolatry. And so they're slaves to sin. They're under Pharaoh. They can't escape. Pharaoh won't let them go. And so God says, I'm going to purchase them with the blood of the lamb. Symbolic. Any firstborn son not protected by the lamb's blood, however, dies. God purchased each Hebrew with the blood of the lamb, made them his own possessions. Holiness is being God's possession in a special way. Holiness is being God's possession in a special way. That's what holiness is. God made the firstborn Hebrew sons holy through the blood of the lamb. He sanctified them. Sanctus just means holy. It's just another word for holy. It's the same thing. It's a Latin word for holy. He made them holy. So the firstborn symbol of the whole family, when God bought the firstborn, he was buying all of Israel. Israel is now God's possession. Now, then, if you indeed obey my voice and hear and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a, what? Holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. God's possession. Terrible judgment of the death of the firstborn sons broke Pharaoh's will and he let the Hebrews go. To call from Moses and Aaron at night says, rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go. Worship the Lord as you have said, take your flocks and your herds. As you have said, and go and bless me also. So God's preparing Israel. I can't tell you how important this is. God was preparing Israel to be his dwelling place on earth so that his presence could return to humanity. That's what this story is about. Yes, of course, it's about Jesus Christ. Of course that. But it's really about making Israel holy because God is going to go with them, be with them, dwell with them. That's what the Ten of Meetings is all about. Later on, that's what the temple is all about. But God wouldn't dwell with them in Egypt because they're not supposed to be in Egypt. I mean, it's the land of idol worshipers. It's not the land. It's not the promised land. So he's got to get them out of Egypt. So he brings them out of Egypt. All right. So as they travel toward the Red Sea, God's presence descends upon his holy possession. And this is absolutely, absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, the Bible says Yahweh is in that cloud. It's a cloud by day and it's a pillar of fire by night. And Yahweh is in it. Now, Yahweh's presence was there in the Garden of Eden. But then they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden was washed away in Noah's flood, so it's gone. Some people think it still exists. No, of course not. It was washed away in Noah's flood. Now, God's possession and presence came back. When? 
people in the burning bush. God's presence is there. Wow. That's a long time without God's presence. But even in the burning bush, Moses takes off his shoes because it's holy ground. But that's not the same. Now God is with them. He's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He went in the fire by night and in the cloud by day to guide you on the road you were to travel. God went in the cloud, the fire by night and the cloud by day. God's there. God's presence is back. Seems like a great step forward. Adam and Eve were cast out of God's presence in Eden, but now God's presence has come to Israel. God sanctified the Hebrews through the blood. God's presence had come to them and was leading them to the land. And they start leaving, but there's a complication. What about their slave master? His arms are mighty, and if he chose, he could bring them back. And see, the, 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 the thing in the story is that God's purchased them, but Satan still, or Pharaoh, who symbolizes Satan, doesn't want to let them go. So now we got a problem. So Pharaoh gets all of his Pharaoh gets all of his chariots ready and takes his people with him. He takes six hundred select chariots and other chariots of Israel with, with officers over all of them. So this is a big deal. This is a giant army. What's going on is that remember the battle is between Pharaoh and God. Pharaoh does not want to let the Hebrews go. So God has purchased them. The price has been paid to the cross. But now, what do we need? We need some way to set them free from their slavery to Pharaoh. Okay? So Pharaoh still has power. So now God brought Israel to a place of utter destruction, their graves at the Red Sea. And it's so important. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened. And so the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. That's what I would do too. Then they said to Moses, I love this line. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Now, I want you to understand that this is not accidental. This is not. This is the commentary part. The event, the story is there. It's happening. They are slaves they're purchased they're running they're trying to get away from their slave masters they can't escape from their slave masters he won't let them go and now they have only two choices their slave master is behind them ready to bring them back the red sea which cannot be passed it lies in front of them so they have on the one hand they have slavery with pharaoh on the other hand they have death in the Red Sea. Those are their only two options. It's not, it's not the word we spoke to in Egypt saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians rather than die in the wilderness. The Egyptians represent slavery. The Red Sea represents death. Okay, so here we are. Purchased. The purchase is not done. The very place which seemed to be their graves becomes the salvation of the Lord. Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Lord whom you have seen today, you will never see. I'm sorry, the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Now here is grace. They can't do anything. All of this is a work that God must do. He pays the price. But then God also does the miracle of bringing them to their graves. Okay? So first, God's presence becomes a wall of fire, which the Egyptians dare not pass. Then the angel of God, who was going in front of the Israelite forces, moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and stood between them. It came between the Egyptians and the Israelite forces. The cloud was there in the darkness, yet it lit up the night, so neither the group came near the other all night long. So first, the presence of God is protecting them. Second, God brings a mighty wind to open the unpassable Red Sea. I'm going to read this verse, even though it's taking a long time. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. 
And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, though through his chariots and his horsemen, and the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. And so God opens the sea. Three miracles happening here. Three astonishing and wonderful miracles happening. Miracle one, he created a path for his Israelites through the Red Sea for a certain grave. And I want you to see the Red Sea as the place of death. That's what the commentary is telling us. It's their graves they're going to. They're going to die in the Red Sea. Either they, become, they go back to their slavery under Pharaoh, or they're going to die in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is their grave, okay? Miracle one. Miracle two. He takes the grave and he walks them into their grave. He places them in, in, into their grave in the Red Sea, right? And then what he does is they die in the Red Sea and they, he then completely breaks Barrow's power there. Think about it. Think about it. Purchased by the blood of the Lamb, but put to death in the Red Sea, which is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. Miracle three. They come out the other side of the Red Sea, and they are no longer slaves. Why? Well, first of all, they were purchased by God, their God's possession. Secondly, why? Because their slave owners have been defeated. Where? Oh, in the graves. The very place where they were supposed to die. The very place where the Hebrews were supposed to be defeated and die is the very place where Satan and all of his evil forces are destroyed, defeated, broken. They're broken in the grave of Jesus Christ. So what God does is he takes believers in Jesus Christ at birth, at new birth, and he takes them first. The blood of Jesus Christ is the purchase. He purchases believers to himself. Secondly, what does he do? He buries them. It says, well, I'll just go to the next next slide. Uh, two slides over. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll come to it later. Okay, so they passed through the Red Sea to the freedom. He entirely broke Pharaoh's um, power over them, crushing them, so that Pharaoh no longer is able he is no longer able to be their slave master. What does the Bible say? That God transferred us out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of the son of his love, right? That's what it says. We're transferred out of Satan's kingdom into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's why I don't believe that Christians can be demon-possessed. I don't care what you've experienced. I'm telling you, Christians cannot be demon-possessed. And when people say, oh, it's a demon that's doing this. No. Yes, demons throw people into prison. Yes, demons can have, have permission to give people sicknesses. Yes, but you are not under any demon's authority ever, 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 ever. Why? You were transferred out of that kingdom. How? In the grave. When you were buried with Jesus Christ. When you were buried with Jesus Christ, you were set free from all of Satan's authority and all of the demonic authority of you. It's broken. I'm telling you, it's completely broken in the cross. Okay, so here we go. <coughs> so this Passover is preparation for the final Passover. God sent his only unique son to make sinners holy through his blood as a true sac sacrifice lamb. God had to sanctify sinners to be his dwelling place. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, made holy. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of our God. Sanctify means to make holy. Blood of pure lamb. Our only protection from the penalty of our sins is Jesus' blood. We trust in the blood of Jesus to make us holy before God. We know there's nothing we can do ourselves but only trust in Jesus' blood bus.
When Jesus ate that final Passover, he explained what Passover really was. This bread is my body, broken for you. This is the covenant in my blood. Okay? So what, what, is, what is Passover then? Passover is the lamb sacrificed, the blood, which is the purchase price. But it's also the death, right? It's the death. The Red Sea is a picture of how God buried us with Christ. So the Red Sea is a picture of how God buried us with Christ. They entered the Red Sea on the Egypt side. They're slaves. The slave master tries to bring them back, but their slave master is defeated in the grave. The Hebrews come out of the Red Sea. They are free people and no longer slaves, but forever. They are no longer slaves and never can be. So God sanctified us through Christ's blood and God freed us from our sin and Adam's curse through Christ's burial in the grave. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us have been baptized in Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. For sin shall not be master over you, you are not under law, but under grace. Sin is no longer our master. We're no longer under Satan's rule. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. Well, how did God rescue Israel? Well, with the plagues, the 10 plagues, with the death of the newborn, of the firstborn sons, and with the protection of the purchase price of the blood of the lamb, and then with the miraculous burying them in the Red Sea, they come out on the other side. All of their enemies that are their slaveholders are destroyed in that, in the grave, the watery grave, and they're set free. So the story of the Passover then, let me turn, stop the share. The story of the Passover then becomes this amazing story in God's salvation story because the commentary is all there. The commentaries in the Old Testament, the commentaries in the Zabor, the commentaries in the prophets, the commentary is definitely in the book of Exodus. It's also in the book of Leviticus. It's also in the book of Deuteronomy. The commentary is there and the prophets. It's a very, very important story in the Old Testament. And the commentary is there in the New Testament as well. And Paul tells us that we were that Israel was baptized into Moses in the Red Sea. That's where they became free from their slavery to Egypt. Now, all of this, we put it all together. What does this all tell us? It tells us that God's salvation story has this remarkable, this remarkable commentary that explains what's happening. It also has this remarkable typology, which really helps us to understand our faith in Jesus Christ. Because in the end, and this is the important part, the salvation story is about the promise that God gave to Eve, that her seed, seed would crush Satan's head. Well, guess what? In the Passover, Pharaoh, who is a type of Satan, Pharaoh is crushed, broken, defeated, made powerless, where? Well, in the cross of Christ, in the burial of Christ. What on earth is that all about? Isn't that crazy that Satan is completely defeated there? And those who belong to Jesus Christ come out of the grave with Christ because they're raised up with Christ. They're buried with Christ and they're raised up with Christ and they come out as free people and no longer under the authority and power of Satan. And so what God has done is he's taken this amazing story, which is absolutely breathtaking, amazing story of, the, of Genesis, I mean, Exodus. And he takes this story, tells us the story, gives us the commentary, 
applies it to our lives in Jesus Christ. And of course, it would be our lives in Jesus Christ because the person that was promised to Eve in Genesis chapter 315 is Jesus Christ. He's the seed of Eve who crushes Satan's head. And the promise that God gives to Moses is Jesus Christ. The promise that God gives to Israel is Jesus Christ. The promise that God gave to Abraham is Jesus Christ. It's always Jesus Christ. Every promise in Christ is yes. So this is the story. This is what's going on. And um, yes, it is the central story of the Old Testament. No question about it. Um, again and again and again and again and again, it's referred to, you'll see it in the Zabor especially, it's referred to continually in the Zabor as the most important event in Israel's history. Why? Because it's where they became free and they became God's people. Purchased through the blood and set free through their baptism in the Red Sea. Okay? So I hope this makes sense to you and uh, we'll do some talking about it as time goes on. God bless and thank you very much for your time.